The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will, re will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of the little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. One of the most consistent pieces of feedback that the staff and the pastors at Grace receive from people that are new visitors and people in the new members class is just how welcoming a church Grace is. That's usually the very first thing they share. Kearney and I experienced that many years ago, the first time we entered this space as, as strangers. Several of you, and I can see you sitting here, approached us and welcomed us as guests. And you made us feel very welcome, and then you talked to us at coffee afterwards. And it wasn't just a perfunctory welcome the first week. Every Sunday, people were greeting us, and not just as new faces, but as friends, and eventually as family. We quickly felt at home here. And that's the same feedback the staff gets over and over again from visitors and new members. And that doesn't happen very often, especially that quickly in most situations. We humans are normally pretty guarded and take some time sizing up other people before we allow ourselves to become vulnerable and to enter into new relationships. It's just kind of how we're wired. I've been in countless churches over the course of my life, some more welcoming than others. And I can say with certainty, after being in a number of churches, that grace is one of the most welcoming communities of faith I have ever experienced. It's just part of who we are as a church. The atmosphere is so pervasive and welcoming here that we even manage to avoid one of the most terrifying experiences in all of Christendom. And that is going into a church as a visitor and accidentally sitting in someone's regular pew and then dealing with the look. We don't do that here. Welcoming guests is in Grace's DNA. It's also in our name. It's one reason that several years ago, the congregation intentionally voted to become a Reconciling in Christ congregation, to publicly extend our welcome to everyone, to all of God's children. So because of all that welcome, when I first read the gospel lesson this week, I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be real easy to preach on. Grace clearly has extending a welcome in Jesus' name down perfectly. And this past month, We've even done Jesus one better. Instead of giving a cup of cold water to others in the name of a disciple, we've been serving cake after worship each week during what pastors Heidi and Ben referred to as the month of cake. And who doesn't like cake better than cold water? So this is going to be a real easy sermon to preach. All I'd have to do is read the gospel, say, nice job, folks, you got this one nailed, now let's all pat ourselves on the back and go back to our normal lives. But friends, is being a disciple of Jesus ever this easy? Is reading, proclaiming, and living the gospel always so clear-cut and straightforward? Read three verses, check off each one, and move on? Today's passage from Matthew is the concluding paragraph from what has come to be known as Jesus' mission discourse to his disciples. He is sending them out to minister and proclaim the kingdom of God. Chapter 10 begins, Jesus sent out the 12 with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, 
and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. In other words, Jesus is preparing his disciples to go out and do ministry in his name. It's what Jesus is calling us to do also as his disciples. I sometimes speak and others speak of the topsy-turvy gospel or the upside-down kingdom of God. By that I mean Jesus' emphasis on putting the last first and the first last or bringing down the mighty from their thrones. You get the picture. So maybe Jesus' message in today's gospel isn't quite so simple. Perhaps Jesus is not talking about extending a welcome, but rather receiving a welcome. Receiving a welcome. Receiving a welcome in Jesus' name. What would that look like, and what would be the impact of that? Friends, receiving welcome can be difficult for many of us. It seems so counterintuitive. We've been taught and trained our entire lives to extend welcome as a way of helping others. We've also been taught to go out and help those in need, those the less fortunate. After all, isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Go out and help others? But therein lies the problem. We can easily fall into the practice of ministering to others from a position of relative privilege. And I'm a perfect example of that. For many years, I was very active in a church that placed great emphasis on social justice issues. We were involved in all sorts of programs. One program that was especially dear to my heart involved making soup and fresh meals each week in our church kitchen and then driving down, delivering, and serving them to San Lucas UCC Church in Humboldt Park in Chicago. We were clearly meeting a need, and the people were very grateful for the meal. But we really weren't in community with them. We served them, and then we went back home to our comfortable lives. We had no idea what it would mean to actually receive a welcome they were trying to extend to us, to actually be in relationship with us. It's important to remember that Jesus' disciples and Jesus himself were ministering from the margins. They were not from the privileged society of Roman society. They were the outcasts. They were the other. Pastor and author Debbie Thomas puts it well. Clearly, Jesus thought there was great value in ministering from the margins. He wanted Christian witness to flow from humility and vulnerability not from complacency and comfort. He wanted his good news to pre be preached from a place unencumbered and untainted by the temptations and corruptions of human power. He wanted the message of God's saving love to come from dependent outsiders, from the edges of society, not from the center. Here at Grace, we say that we are striving to be the heart hands, feet, and voice of Jesus in the world. In other words, we are striving to be the body of Christ in our world today. So, friends, if we are going to truly be Christ's body on earth, Jesus is telling us we first have to understand the world from his perspective, from the margins. But how do we do that? How can we truly understand someone else's needs when we aren't living their lives. That's especially problematic for some of us who are rel living relatively comfortable lives compared to many others. That's where learning to receive welcoming comes in. And learning to receive someone's welcome involves risks. We have to be vulnerable. We have to learn to meet people where they are in their pain, in their challenges, in their uncertainties. And sometimes being with others in their pain is difficult because then we have to acknowledge it and feel it. 
We can no longer just retreat to our comfortable lives and let someone else worry about it. We will be changed. During my time in seminary, during my internship, and more recently during my work here as the Minister for Community Care, have opened my eyes to what it means to actually receive a person's welcome, to actually be a guest. I've had the honor and privilege, and believe me, it is a privilege to be invited into people's lives and their joys and struggles. But I'll admit, it was very difficult for me at first. I even questioned whether this is what I really wanted to do with my life. But as I learned how to be vulnerable and thus truly present to others, I began to understand better their lives, the struggles, and their concerns. It was very different from just simply serving food at San Lucas. I was learning to be in true community with others and not just helping people from afar. I was learning to be a guest and that I didn't always have to be the host. Friends, I'm excited to share that over the next several months, we are going to embark on a new ministry here at Grace a new way of being in loving community with each other. We are going to establish a dedicated team of lay visitors to expand our ability and our call to care for and minister to others. This will be an expansion of the wonderful caring ministries we already have in place here, such as the Stephen Ministry and, uh, and others. As part of this new ministry, we are partnering with Bishop Anderson House, which is affiliated with Rush University Medical Center, to provide spiritual care lay visitor training here at Grace in September. We'll be sharing more about this new ministry over the next several weeks. As we do, I would ask you to prayerfully consider if you might want to be a part of this new ministry. I have witnessed firsthand how even small acts of reaching out and ministering to others can profoundly change lives, both in my life and in the lives of others. I have witnessed firsthand what it means to be received as a guest into people's lives, to meet them just as Jesus met those he, he was ministering to, in their joys, in their challenges, in their struggles. I invite you to join us on this journey. One of my favorite writers, Pastor Mary Ludy, has a wonderful devotional that captures just what it means to be a guest and not always the host. I'd like to share it with you this morning. I find only three instances in Scripture where Jesus hosts a meal. The improvised feeding of the 5,000, the members-only Last Supper, and the post-resurrection breakfast for a handful of frustrated fishermen. Other than that, Jesus doesn't host anyone at his table. He doesn't have a table. He's always at somebody else's. Tax collectors like Levi and Zacchaeus throw him banquets. Pharisees, too. Peter's wife feeds him. And Martha and Bethany. Jesus doesn't invite. He gets invited. So when we say we welcome everyone to the church's table because Jesus welcomed everyone to his... We're on shaky evidentiary ground, which doesn't argue for exclusion. It only suggests that Jesus may present a challenge to us, not so much because he was a gracious host, but because he was a willing guest. If our churches aren't very inclusive, it might be because too many of us have mistaken, mistaken ourselves for the giver of the feast. We're not host extending invitations. We're guests among guests. Yet we behave as if having arrived earlier than others has given us proprietary rights to the hall, which means we haven't yet pondered deeply enough the mercy, capital M, by which we all got here in the first place. Our churches will more closely resemble God's all-embracing realm when we relinquish our sense of entitlement to them. Cease welcoming others as if there's such a thing as others. Stop playing munificent hosts and learn to be good guests. People of grace, dear friends, 
Many of us have learned to be gracious hosts and welcome others. We're good at it. We feel comfortable extending a helpful and welcoming hand. And don't get me wrong, that's very important. But let's challenge ourselves just a bit. Let's take some risks. As the body of Christ on earth, let's follow Jesus' call to be both good hosts and gracious guests. Let's learn to meet people where they truly are by truly opening ourselves to be received as one of Jesus' disciples, both here at church and also, and equally important, in our wider community. Let's carry Christ's image into the world with humility, compassion, understanding, and of course, much love. Let's learn to be in true relationship with all of God's children. Then, and only then, we'll truly be Christ's hands, heart, feet, and voice in our world. Amen.